Right. Right. Good afternoon, um, everyone. My name is Alistair Burt. I'm the chairman of the Emirates Society, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this very special webinar this afternoon, uh, which will look ahead at the Mars mission of the UAE. Before I introduce our very distinguished panelists, uh, could I uh, just go run through a few technicalities? Um, we will uh, ask or ensure that people are muted, both for voice and for picture during the course of the uh, event, simply because, as we all know now, it improves the bandwidth and the quality no end. I'd be very interested, as, after, as the, the, the panelists speak, if there are questions uh, for them. Um, I'm hoping our panelists will speak for 25 minutes or, or so, and that will give us a, a good 35 minutes plus for questions. I'd look to finish within the hour, but we may run over a little if there are, uh, if there are questions still unanswered, but we won't go beyond an hour and a quarter, which is fair on everyone's uh, time. If you'd like to ask a question, um, as you know, on the system, uh, if you, you should have a Q&A uh, available to you, do please put down a question uh, on that uh, and do indicate whether you would like to ask your question personally, uh, because we can unmute you for that, or whether you would uh, be content for me to ask the question on uh, your behalf. But if you would do that, uh, that would be that would be very good. Uh, can I also say that we are recording this uh, because it's uh, such a significant event so it will be uh, on the record because it will allow people to hear our participants and what they have to say so do be conscious of that in relation to, to questions and the like afterwards if that's a matter of, uh, of interest for you. But I think that's all the, the technicalities, I think most people now are very used to this system so it's a, a great opportunity to welcome people this afternoon uh, to a discussion uh, about hope the uh, mission to mars which will be launched uh, very shortly uh, by the uae uh, the uae uh, will become the first arab country to send a mission to mars uh, as we know space travel has by and large been the uh, been in the grip of a very small select number of superpowers so this is a great opportunity for the uae to go beyond that uh, and to go into something different uh, we're, I'm very grateful that the panellists will include uh, the following. Uh, first of all, Her Excellency Sarah Al-Amiri. Sarah is the chair of the UAE Council of Scientists. She's the deputy project manager for the uh, HOPE uh, project and mission to Mars, uh, but she is also significantly the Minister of State for Advanced Sciences in the UAE, UAE Cabinet with a very distinguished academic record and background. Uh, she is joined by uh, Omran Sharaf, who is the project manager for the UAE HOPE uh, space project to Mars. Um, uh, Omran was the first employee, I understand, to join the Emirates Institute for Advanced Science and Technology. Uh, like Her Excellency, a distinguished record, particularly in satellite construction and management. Um, and as I say, he is the project manager uh, of the uh, uh, of the Hope mission to Mars. Joining them uh, is Sir Ian Blatchford. Ian is the director of the Science Museum uh, and has been for some years uh, a distinguished uh, academic record as well, read law at Oxford, which is a very good start for most people in life, um, and has gone on from that to a career uh, both in finance and in culture, having worked with the Arts Council, the Royal Academy, the V&A, uh, and now the science, uh, the science a museum. I have no scientific or space background but I do have a copy of the Eagle behind me uh, and for viewers who are maybe not uh, familiar with that the Eagle was a definitive comic uh, for uh, small boys in the past uh, with Dan Dare, a space pilot of the future prominently, uh, prominently featured. And my other claim to fame is that I served in Parliament with Andrew Folds who was Jet Morgan in the radio series Journey into Space which excited a number of us many years ago when we were young. So I am a space enthusiast, and I'm sure there's quite a number of space enthusiasts on the call. But it is my pleasure to turn to the experts to talk about this. Uh, and perhaps, Your Excellency, you and uh, Omran would lead us into uh, a, an introduction about 
the mission to Mars, what it hopes to achieve, uh, and what it conveys to all of us. Thank you very much for joining us. Please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to discuss the Emirates Mars mission. I truly hope that everybody's having a great day. Um, and thank you to the Emirates Society for setting this up um, uh, for all of us here and for Sir Ian to join us um, on this important call that uh, separates us from the launch of the Emirates Mars mission by roughly um, 40 days, uh, close to one month from launch. Um, one of the foremost questions that we always get about the Emirates Mars mission and the UAE heading, why? Why is the UAE looking at space exploration? Why are we looking at sending a spacecraft to Mars? What brought that to the agenda of a country that is under 50 years of age, um, has um, garnered development across different sectors, not necessarily fully stemmed in science and technology and, and rooted within that area. That being said, the UAE currently is working towards its diversification plan, and more importantly, the diversification plan of our economy as a whole. And the root of that is deeply rooted in science and technology. Today, the UAE is an economy that is based on services. It is also based on um, logistics and also based on um, oil and gas. Um, within the region, it is considered a diversified economy. But if we project that down the line, the importance of knowledge intensive sectors becomes more and more prominent for the country. And when you're talking about knowledge intensive sectors, we are, creating a, we are talking about the creation of more knowledge intensive sectors within the UAE's economy, but more importantly, creating new knowledge intensive organizations. Now, what does this drill down to? The need for experience and expertise, both from the customer's perspective, from a developer's perspective, from an investor's perspective, um, and more importantly, from the talent basis expert, uh, perspective. And the development of engineers then becomes vital as the first step and to creating more opportunity for scientists and researchers working in the natural sciences becomes the following um, step and the following important endeavor for the country. Now, how do you develop experience? If you take the, the typical journey of a generic engineer graduating uh, within the UAE, and I'll take my experience graduating from one of the universities um, based here in the UAE as a computer engineer, what you're faced with is, is job opportunities for engineers to maintain systems that have been set up. So as a computer engineer, my primary job opportunity has been in maintenance of, um, of either control systems or maintenance and support and deployment of communication systems and something around that realm. So there's systems that have been developed by other entities that have been deployed here and are now converted into services. That being said, if you're talking about a knowledge-based economy, you need to have two kinds of engineers and the baseline. Those that maintain and support the, the further enhancement and integration of systems, and more importantly, those that design and develop systems. Um, at that point, I was lucky enough for the UAE having started three years in the making, the Emirates Institution for Advanced Science and Technology, which is now the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center, which is where the Emirates Mars mission resides in. But that was a very small opportunity. At the time that I joined the institution, I think we were about 30 to 40 people who were working um, on the various programs uh, that, are, that are part of this, uh, that is part of this um, institution. Now this institution was instigated as an experiment. And the experiment was this. How do you build experience in a sector that does not exist within the UAE? So typically you'd go to work for the likes of um, typical technology uh, developers or satellite developers in our case where we were working. But in that case, there was no satellite developer in the UAE. There was no entity that you could go and learn from. And there were no other people that, were, that had the necessary experience within the confines of the United Arab Emirates to, to, to take you through the process of design and development. And hence, an experiment needed to be in place. How do you develop the talents? How do you develop the expertise? And it's through a know-how transfer program that was first instigated with South Korea, and then the Emirates Mars mission came to be. Why did we move from developing Earth observation satellites over the course of the first um, seven years of the organization to developing a planetary exploration um, uh, 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 spacecraft? The reason is it's five times more complex. You need to put your engineers and your talent through a rigorous process of design and development. And space provides that, and planetary exploration provides that. It's a big enough challenge, but an attainable one. 
and it, it requires the development of a cross-section of engineering talent. But more importantly, it added one factor that we did not realize was necessary at the point that, that the center was established, and that's science. A lot of missions are either driven by engineering needs or driven by scientific requirements and scientific questions and then developed into systems. The need for scientists and engineers to work together became even more prominent at that point. To be able to create that culture where the silos are broken between engineering and science and the requirement to work together is inevitable in space and it's ine inevitable in planetary exploration. So Mars provided us with the necessary challenge to, to rigorously develop talent in engineering. It gave us a larger appetite for risk and being able to circumvent that risk and, and push forward with, it, with a mission for development. And it allowed us to start integrating and creating new opportunities for scientists within the UAE and those studying the natural sciences. And with this, what we're now looking at is how do we deploy further this model that has been constructed in planetary exploration for the UAE and deploy it across the development of various sectors, creating new companies in, say, pharmaceuticals, because that has become evident at our, our new day and age, or in biotechnology, or in agriculture technology, and start developing these new nuclei across the country that, that have the necessary talent, the necessary customer base, the necessary investors, and the necessary developers for these organizations to um, exist. Thank you very much. Um... Uh, that's, a, a, that's a great explanation as to how the country got into this uh, and I, I think your point about the extra rigour that was involved, the degree of risk taking, uh, advancing by effectively by challenge uh, was well made. Uh, now, does uh, Omran want to take us into the, uh, the nature of the project itself or Your Excellency, do you want to lead into that uh, and then Omran can come in after? Omran can take it and I think we can share the slides so, so we can see some images of the spacecraft. Okay, if you'd like to call for the slides, I think they're, uh, they're uh, ready and waiting. There we are. The slides are up, Your Excellency, so please talk to them as you wish. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency, uh, for, the, for the introduction. Uh, and I'd like to thank everyone who, who's participating here with us today and shows interest in the mission. So uh, as uh, Her Excellency mentioned, um, uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so the MS Mars mission, the story of the MS Mars mission started not in 2014 when the mission was announced. It actually started in 2006 uh, with the establishment of the Emirates Institution for Advanced Science Technology. Um, a team of engineers were tasked, uh, Emirati fresh graduates, we're tasked to, 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 to explore Earth observation missions and to work on a know-how transfer program with our South Korean partners, Satellite Initiative, to build our first satellite, Dubai Sat-1, uh, which was a 2.5 meter resolution uh, remote sensing satellite. And later on, we worked on, the, after the successful launch of Dubai Sat-1, we worked on Dubai Sat-2, a one meter resolution spacecraft, and then Khalifa Sat, uh, which was built in the UAE. Um, so, in 2013, towards the end of 2013, the government, just before the launch of Dubai Sat 2, when we, start, when we started working on Khalifa Sat, uh, the government came to us with a different set of requirements. Um, they wanted us to look into Mars. Uh, and, and the reason behind that was basically that in the previous years, uh, when we started working on our Earth, Earth observation missions, the focus was on fresh graduates. The focus was on the ongoing programs that exist already uh, within the UAE. Uh, more than 90% of the employees in the Mohammed Barash Space Center are graduates uh, from UAE universities, uh, and they are 100% Emiratis. Um, so they wanted us to take it to the next level, as Her Excellency mentioned. They wanted us to open an opportunity or create a career path for scientists. Uh, a lot of the universities and the academic sector in the UAE was focused on engineering. So a, a, a career, ha a path had to be created for, for the scientists. And, and at the same time, they wanted us to inspire Emirati youth to go, into, to go into STEM. So the focus was not on fresh graduates or people joining the universities. Actually, the focus was on a much wider range, uh, basically youth in school and all the way going to, to university and graduating and, and, and pursuing then graduate studies. Uh, the government, government wanted to see a big disruptive change in different uh, sectors that will help 
us in building our knowledge-based economy, uh, the post oil economy, and also in addressing our national challenges, whether it comes to food, water, or energy uh, resources. Um, these are our existing challenges, and they wanted the, 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 the science technology sector in the UAE to, to address that. And they wanted the space sector to be a tool to build the capacity and capability to do that. Uh, the other requirement that the government came and told us was the science has to be unique. And uh, that will be uh, covered by, by Eric Salinas Sahara later on. And it shouldn't be something that was done, done before. And another important requirement was basically, you're going to build it, you're not going to buy it. The same way that you started the know-how transfer program in Dubai Site 1 and Dubai Site 2, and you learned from your colleagues in South Korea and partners, and then you shifted that uh, capacity and capability to the UAE and built Khalifa Sat. We'd like to do the same thing with science missions uh, and more specifically uh, outer space exploration missions. Um, however, they wanted us to start, come with a new model in which in, Khali in Dubai Sat 1 and Dubai Sat 2, we were based in South Korea. I was based in South Korea for seven years, working in Dubai Sat 1 and Dubai Sat 2. Uh, but with, 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 with Emirates Mars mission, they wanted to come up with a more of a hybrid kind of a, uh, approach in which we do have a team that works with a partner, uh, a knowledge transfer partner, can be based outside, but also we have a team that's based in the UAE that's working in the UAE. Uh, so based on our experience, that's what we had to formulate. And they wanted us to come up with an Emirati model of executing such missions. Uh, they were very clear with us from day one that the mission had to be efficient uh, and, and had to be effective. And we wanted to show the rest of the world how things can be done differently. And that was linked to the last requirement, which is was one of the most important requirements set through the mission also, which is not just focused on the UAE, but also on the region, which was to celebrate our 50th anniversary, which is the 2nd of December 2021, with a very big achievement by reaching Mars. And it's a message, not just for the Emirati youth, but also for the Arab youth, the youth of the region. You're talking about the region that has more than 100 million youth in it, with a lot of potential, a lot of skills. Unfortunately, at that time when the mission was uh, being uh, announced uh, in 2014, uh, the region was going through a lot of tough times. Um, it's a region that more than 800 years ago used to be uh, a generator of knowledge, uh, uh, an example of coexistence and, 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 and uh, cooperation of people of different faiths, different backgrounds, uh, contributed in building the region. The moment we stopped doing that, we started going, moving backwards. And this is what the message that the UAE would like to send to the, to the Arab youth, is that given your history, uh, given your achievements in the past, you can do much more uh, by putting our differences aside and working together, by focusing on building our nations rather than uh, destroying things. Um, at that point, youth were either leaving the region, which did not help us and moving forward, or unfortunately, we're investing their energy and innovation and creativity in the wrong ways by joining the wrong groups. Um, so basically, we had six years. So the mission was announced officially in 2014. And we had six years to formulate the mission, come up with unique scientific questions, uh, identify partners, and actually deliver the mission. So by itself, it's a big challenge. because. Similar missions have pre previously been executed over 10 to 12 years. Uh, and so we had almost half that duration. And this, again, that's linked to the messaging of the, of, 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 of the mission. And the reason why it was called hope, again, it's a hope for the Emirati youth, for the future of the Emirati youth and of the UAE, and also for the Arab youth. So the meaning of, so the name of the mission has a big meaning behind it. Um, can we go to the next slide? So one of the first things that we basically uh, did was identifying our partners. Uh, so the mission, so our recommendation was to the government to announce when, when they wanted to announce mission also to uh, uh, establish the space agency, uh, more of a federal entity, because as a Mohammed Barash Space Center, we are more of a local entity. We want to establish a federal entity that will help in building a sustainable uh, outer, space, outer space exploration uh, program and also uh, a more sustainable national space program that will serve the economy. So they announced the establishment of uh, the UAE Space Agency and uh, the Space Agency was tasked to have a, a general supervision of the mission 
And the Mohammed Bar Space Center was tasked to manage, execute, uh, and, and develop uh, the mission. Uh, we selected our partners. Our main partner is the University of Colorado uh, at Boulder, represented by LASP, uh, Laboratory for uh, Atmospheric uh, Space uh, Physics. And, and also we had uh, Arizona State University and uh, SSL at University of California in Berkeley working with us on the scientific aspect of the mission and on the instruments. Um, which was very different than what we actually did before. So, uh, and the reason why we selected the universities is because these universities have long history in, in, in developing science instruments, uh, in, in conducting science research, uh, and also had uh, the resources or the, the capacity to tap into the knowledge area that we needed to be able to, to deliver this, uh, this mission. Um, and um, as, 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 as Her Excellency mentioned, the mission itself was five times more complicated than uh, previous missions. And another requirement that was set to us was the government wanted to see tangible shifts and change in the mindset and also within different sectors. So we had to engage the different sectors in the UAE, whether it's academic, industrial sector, uh, SMEs, we had to work with them all to make them part of the mission. Um, and, and that introduce another set of challenges. So it's not just technical challenges, actually there's other um, 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 things that we had to, to address. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? And with this, I would like to uh, allow my colleague Sarah to uh, speak more about the, the, the science and, and, and the, 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 the uniqueness of, of the mission uh, we have to conduct. So one of the requirements that we were asked very early on is to send a mission that goes to Mars and not only captures an image declaring that the UAE reached Mars. So the entire prospect of having a scientific mission, one that scientists require the data for. So there are questions that are posed by the international science community that are studying Mars um, that currently don't have missions that go together with it and provide the data to be able to study that. Um, and ensuring that it's complementary to other missions. So it is an active area of research that the UAE can focus on developing its talents and skills, but more importantly, providing the data of this mission to scientists around the world so that it's not, a, it's not only off benefit to the UAE, but rather to the global uh, science community. And that's where the, the addressing of the science questions of the Emirates Mars mission and the objective of the Emirates Mars mission came from. What we're doing is studying the weather on Mars throughout an entire Martian year. So we are the very first weather satellites of Mars. Now, why is that important? Prior to this, we've been studying the weather um, on that planet and understanding better the climate of Mars by sporadically sampling various areas around the planet, but not understanding it holistically. So not understanding the changes that happen throughout an entire day. So it's very similar to me trying to tell you to come here, study Earth at different times of the day um, in Alaska, London, and, and the UAE, and be able to form a complete picture of the weather system on Mars and the climate um, on, uh, sorry, on Earth and the climate on Earth. You need to fill in the gap with more understanding and more data to be able to transform those theories into actual hard evidence and observed data that furthers science. Another thing that we're looking at is the reason for atmospheric loss. Again, atmospheric loss has been studied extensively on Mars. The reason for that, it's one of the reasons by which liquid water no longer can exist in its, in its pure form on the surface of Mars. So we're looking now and studying a planet that, that has indications that it was very similar to our own planet that has undergone some form of change and has gotten to a point where it can't have one of the major building blocks of life as we humans know it and as we humans have defined it. And therefore understanding the reasons for the loss of hydrogen and oxygen, the building blocks of water from the atmosphere of Mars and understanding what role does Mars itself play. So as an example, one of the studies that we're looking at is if there is a major dust storm on Mars, does that increase rates of escape of hydrogen and oxygen? Now that has been observed slightly. There's some theories that exist out there, but again, there's no hard data that actually correlates that. And that provides us the correlation between climate change and atmospheric loss that is quite important for this mission. How do we go about studying that? It's through the utilization of three different 
um, of three different instruments that fly on board the spacecraft. EMIRS is the Emirates Infrared Spectrometer. That's what primarily gives us the temperature off the lower atmosphere of Mars. That's where the weather exists. And more importantly, it looks at the dust and the cloud system um, that exists there and understands it throughout an entire year. And it studies that using infrared. Uh, we then have the Emirates Exploration Imager. This provides us of images of Mars and also provides us an understanding of the distribution of ozone, which is one of the constituents of the Martian lower atmosphere. Then we look at the upper atmosphere and we look at how far um, hydrogen and oxygen extends into, the, uh, in, uh, extends into space and that's how you study atmospheric loss. We use the ultraviolet spectrometer that we have on board um, this spacecraft. And it's through the utilization of these three instruments and the unique orbit that the Emirates Mars mission um, flies that we're able to, throughout an entire Martian year, that's two years of data collection, answer the scientific objectives that have been posed at the beginning um, of this mission. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows a bit of um, uh, an, an infographic of this uh, of the spacecraft and where the instruments are all positioned. It's the weight of the spacecraft that's including the fuel and it's being fueled this week. Uh, is 1,350 kilograms. Uh, it, it, the solar panels produce about 600 watts, uh, and it is sort of the dimension of a very small car. Um, and um, it's currently in Japan uh, awaiting um, launch. Next slide, please. Amran, um, I'll pass this on to you to talk about the just the brief development timeline of the Emirates Mars mission from its uh, from the that's post the development timeline and not the conception timeline. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, so yeah, so the development basically started right after the mission was announced. We had to come up with the with, with the mission concept, uh, and that uh, was completed in two thousand and fifteen. Uh, from basically mid two thousand and fifteen till. Uh, about early 2018, we were designing and, 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 and uh, developing the different subsystems uh, of the spacecraft and testing it uh, towards the end of 2018. Uh, and same thing when it came to the instruments, when it came to the engineering models. Uh, 2018, we started the assembly of the, of the, of the spacecraft itself. Uh, and, and in 2019, we started the environmental testing uh, of the spacecraft. Uh, the spacecraft was exposed to different uh, kind of uh, harsh uh, um, testing, which includes uh, acoustic vibration uh, testing, uh, shock tests, um, and that was completed towards the end of 2019. And in 2020, we had solar panel deployment tests and, and another kind of uh, functional test, regression testing taking place, uh, instrument alignment testing, uh, and that was done and completed. Um, the spacecraft was shipped to uh, Japan in April uh, 2020, uh, almost uh, three weeks earlier than scheduled. And the reason behind that was the COVID-19 situation. Uh, the co like, nothing about this mission has been easy, I have to say. Since day one, the, the time frame has been challenging. Uh, the, the, the budget itself has been a big challenge. Very strict uh, requirements when it came to the budget and a limited budget and uh, that would be announced uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a later stage. Um, so, uh, so basically, and then the COVID-19 situation came into place also on top of the technical challenges. Uh, because of the nature of the project, because the UA does not have a launch base and we have to utilize existing uh, launch services, so we are using the H2A launch service. Uh, which is a Mitsubishi launcher. Uh, so we had to ship it to Japan. And as you know, there was like travel restrictions when it came to team traveling to Japan, when it came to shipping things out of UAE, shipping things into Japan. So there was a lot of hurdles that came up because of that, but the team had to manage it and had to um, arrange for these uh, exemptions to happen uh, to, to, to deliver the spacecraft on time. Other missions, the Mars missions that are gonna be launched this year, they all, launch from like the geographical locations within their territories. So it's not a challenge when it came, it's a challenge, but it's not, it's not as like that, that COVID-19 issue did, when it comes to travel restrictions did, didn't affect them as much as it affected us. Um, can you go to the next slide? So this is just a, a, a general infographic about the mission. So uh, it will be launched uh, July, mid-July uh, this year. Uh, on 
H2A launcher, it's a two-stage Mitsubishi launcher. Um, uh, the spacecraft is going to separate from the launch vehicle about 50 minutes after launch um, and will start its seven-month journey towards Mars. Uh, we're scheduled to reach Mars March in February 2021, uh, basically in which we'll have the MOI, the Mark Orbit Insertion, one of the most important phases of the mission after launch. Uh, in which we have to slow down the spacecraft after traveling for more than 419 million kilometers uh, the, from 121,000 kilometers per hour down to 18,000 kilometers per hour. We go too slow, we crash on Mars, we go too fast, we pass Mars. Uh, so, and it, all of that has to happen autonomously because there is about uh, 15 to 20 minutes delay in communication between the spacecraft. So that, this tells you also the magnitude of the, of the complexity when it comes to designing this mission compared to the previous missions we worked on. Um, and this is just a general overview of where we are. And uh, yeah, so I think I will uh, let uh, give the floor to Alistair to manage more. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I mean, that has been absolutely fascinating from from both of you. Um, the, uh, uh, the degree of thought that's gone into this, not only the, the mission itself, but the reach it has both to young people, to the region, the opportunity for hope, and of course the, um, the subject matter itself, climate and atmosphere is probably even more important than when this mission was first considered back in 2006 or 2014. Um, as uh, participants are thinking through their questions and beginning to send them to me, uh, can I ask Tyrion Blatchford of the Science Museum uh, for, a, for an impression of what this is all about and what the distinctive contribution you believe, Ian, is being made by the UAE to space exploration through this mission? Well, thank you, and thank you for um, the panellists so far. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm particularly interested in what the UAE is doing because one of the things that the Science Museum prides itself on with its existing collection and the collection experience its building is a truly international picture of space uh, exploration. So many science museums have a very nationalistic story, um, whereas actually the global story is quite extraordinary. I was going to illustrate the scale of really what's been going on in recent years. Uh, Britain itself actually has a very interesting space program, uh, specialised particularly in scientific instruments and satellites, um, uh, which actually it, it doesn't really sing its song very loudly, but is, is very important. But if you think of the organisations we're already talking to, we have a very strong relationship with the European Space Agency, with Roscosmos, uh, with NASA and also the Air and Space Museum uh, in Washington, also increasingly talking to those huge new participants like uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin. We're also talking to Japan, of course. Um, we're already collecting from the Chinese. Everyone told us that the Chinese wouldn't let us collect their objects. They were wrong. We're collecting from the Chinese. Uh, and also this autumn, I'll be in Bangalore talking to uh, the Indians. Um, so uh, it was re really uh, uh, for us fascinating to discover the UAE uh, had appeared on the landscape. And I think um, the team have just spoken are absolutely right that actually what they're trying to achieve is remarkable for a country that's developing this infrastructure. But particularly, I think they're being very modest in describing the fact they're doing it in half the time. Um, so many of the missions we've been working with, it feels like we've been talking to them forever, whereas actually this new player in the field is fascinating. Also, um, that's very, uh, just a, a quick comment struck by something Omran said, which is the importance of the incredible testing that goes on, on, on Earth before these missions launch. Um, you might be aware of uh, an incredible mission, the European space mission Bepi Columba, which is going to Mercury, which will take seven years. There are actually two Bepi Columbos. There's one actually flying to Mercury uh, from 2018, but this, the twin uh, vehicle is actually sitting in the Science Museum and it was used for the thermal testing. And so the degree of hygiene and testing involved uh, before these uh, missions can launch is absolutely incredible, much more than people could realize. Um, another reason I'm so interested in this is because uh, we're going to launch a massive, probably the biggest ever special exhibition on the history of Mars exploration in 2024. You can see from the poster behind me, we did an exhibition with the Russians. Also, we recently did a huge exhibition on the sun. Um, and because of that, I'm very aware of just how obsessed we are with going to Mars. Um, uh, you'll realize that actually, or perhaps the audience doesn't realize that actually, you can't just launch to Mars whenever you uh, feel 
like it because the pathway of those flights is very much driven by the uh, windows available for it. Uh, and e even without UAE, the three other major missions going to Mars also in the summer of this year, there's the NASA uh, Perseverance uh, probe, uh, Tianwen-1, which is a Chinese probe also launching in 2020. And then in 2022, one that we're deeply involved with is ExoMars, which is a joint mission between the Europeans and the Russians. Um, and it was really because of our research on the exhibition, uh, we discovered uh, what UAE were up to, and then actually were absolutely fascinated by, by what they aim to achieve. Um, I think the obvious, obviously deeply interested, uh, as I'm sure we all are, not only in the mission itself and its science, and let me just dwell quickly on the science, what really strikes me is how articulate that explanation was about the core scientific purpose. A lot of missions to Mars, both planned and in the past, have focused very heavily on geology. Uh, I think the Minister is absolutely right that actually what's really important about this mission is two things. The first is a holistic sense of the atmosphere, uh, the most comprehensive Ever. Also, what I think may not be obvious to colleagues is that I believe, and the minister can perhaps tell if I got this correct, that the data which will be transmitted over two years will be shared with 200 international institutions. So obviously it's an enormous uh, feat of national pride, but like the very best science projects is about sharing in the most noble sense of the word. Um, but the other thing, uh, I just want to say finally about STEM careers. One of the things that's very interesting and a real rebuke to some degree to the uh, long-standing great powers of science is particularly interesting with the newer players like India and the UAE. The real surprise is how many women are working on the program. So in 2017, Mamita Dutta came to the Science Museum. She was the Indian woman in charge of the Mars Orbiter program. About a third of the Indian space program, the employees of women and I think also UAE is aiming for something similar and I think that's fascinating not only because the the gender equality matters but also people are often surprised when they discover that uh, in in the Gulf in terms of uh, space technology and computing actually there's far greater equality than people might expect and obviously that's a pretty impressive achievement and then a final comment on STEM is of course what's very interesting about that explanation it's not just about physics and engineering if you think of the incredible advances in mathematics and computing computing skills that are also required. These are great careers for any nation that really wants to build a great future. So I thought it was uh, uh, absolutely fascinating project. And um, well, I, I have many questions myself, but I'll hold back until perhaps the general audience can ask them. Thanks very much, uh, Ian. And again, your, your enthusiasm uh, bubbles out all over the place in, re 